Hello, and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This is the start of the long-promised French Revolution episode arc. But first, just a quick bit of housekeeping. I've been struggling for the past couple of years to balance the demands of the Patreon video show and the audio podcast, and it's time to make some changes. As of this month, October 2023, the Dan's War College video series will be going on indefinite hiatus. Uh, Frankly, this podcast is still a small channel. It's growing, and I make enough from advertising and patronage to defray the costs of hosting and the odd piece of equipment, but relevant history is still very much a passion project for me. Unfortunately, I've realized that I have been pouring an inordinate amount of energy, a good half of my effort that I put into these creative projects, into creating Patreon videos that only reach a handful of people. Now, for those of you who are patrons, I appreciate your contributions. A few of you are friends and family. Most of us have at least exchanged messages a few times and tossed around a few ideas, which I still plan to get to at some point in the future. I value this sense of community. But at the same time, I want to grow the show, which means reaching more people, which means Dan's War College needs to go on the back burner, at least for now. So effective immediately, I will be converting the Patreon membership from a $5 monthly video subscription to a $1 monthly tip jar. There will be no new Dan's War College videos for the time being, but... All patrons will gain access to all 24 existing video exclusives. All patrons will also continue to have access to the private Discord server, which has basically been silent so far. Part of that is because my audience, I think, does not necessarily overlap as much as I thought it might with people who use Discord, but... Another big reason the Discord server has been so quiet is simply because there are not all that many patrons. And my hope is that with a $1 subscription instead of $5, more people will want to chip in, even if the Dan's War College video series is on hiatus. More people means a more active community, which could really get that Discord server buzzing and create the kind of members-only history buff space I want to build. If you've been on the fence about checking out the Patreon channel and Dan's War College, now is a great opportunity. Because at some point, probably sometime next summer, I plan on bringing that show back and reintroducing the $5 tier for those who want continued access to the videos while maintaining the $1 tier for Discord access. So, why wait? Sign up now at the Patreon link in the show description and find out what you've been missing. Along the same lines, a quick word to my YouTube followers. There aren't very many of you, but there seem to be a few more of you each month, particularly since YouTube added their podcast feature. And a few people have asked me why the video is just a still picture. Well, that's because this isn't a video show. This is an audio podcast available on Spotify, Apple Music, Samsung, and most other platforms. I just throw up a video version, meaning the still picture, on YouTube because it takes five minutes and a few people like to listen that way. I also want to give a big shout out to my friend and fellow podcaster Ben Kitchings over at the History Voyager podcast. Ben interviews people from throughout the world with a particular emphasis on education, history, and the war in Ukraine. And he and I had a great chat back in July about social media and where it's headed. There's a link in the description, and I encourage you to check out my interview with Ben as well as his other episodes. It's all good stuff. 
finally, a quick correction on the previous episode. When the Kennedys entered the White House, they did not have four children, as I said. They had two living children, John and Caroline. A third child had been stillborn, and then, while in the White House, Jackie Kennedy had a fourth child, Patrick, but he died when he was two days old. It was actually kind of a national tragedy, and, well, I flubbed that one. Anyway, let's get started with the French Revolution, and where better than to start with John F. Kennedy? See, American President John F. Kennedy once said, Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. He was talking about Latin America in the 1960s, but he might as well have been talking about France in the late 1700s. In 1789, at the dawn of the French Revolution, King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette are arguably the most powerful married couple in the world. Just four years later, in 1793, spoiler alert, both of them will be dead. They will be publicly beheaded by their own people. And what strikes me is just how avoidable their deaths are and how they have nobody to blame but themselves. Like the Russian Tsarist regime of the early 20th century, the French Ancien regime of the late 18th century is a corrupt edifice that provides a luxurious life for the few while extracting all but the barest necessities from the many. Also like the Tsarist regime, the French regime's ultimate collapse will destroy far more than the regime itself, erasing centuries of culture and tradition and forever altering the course of the nation's history. To understand the French Revolution, it's first necessary to dispel a myth about the French system. What I'm about to say will be obvious if you are French, but half of my audience is American, and in the USA, unless you majored in history in college, you probably learned about the French Revolution in high school world history or Western Civ class, which means you got the short, uber-condensed version. And... In that version of the story, you received what is called a lie to children. A lie to children is a simplified but false version of a complex concept that's used to avoid going off on a tangent. In this case, we Americans, and I assume other English speakers who are not from France, well, We are taught that the French monarchy in the 18th century is an absolutist regime. Now, to some extent, this is true. Louis XIV, who ruled France from 1643 to 1715, spent all of his long reign abolishing parts of the old feudal system. He also revoked the Edict of Nantes, which had established religious toleration, instead opting to expel France's Protestant minority or force them to convert. Most importantly, Louis XIV had built the Palace of Versailles, which is located far enough outside Paris that the country's most powerful nobles would have to stay in his palace if they wanted to talk to him. Uh, They would not be able to stay on their own estates in the city if they wanted to have access to their king. All of these moves had gone a long way towards enhancing royal authority and centralizing power in the hands of one person. On the eve of the French Revolution, King Louis XVI is certainly more powerful than a constitutional monarch like George III of Great Britain, which is why the French monarchy is seen as so absolutist in Anglosphere countries. But Louis XVI is not a czar. 
He is, in fact, limited by a number of old laws and traditions, some of which date back to the earliest days of the French state. As we'll see, you could make the argument that if France were more absolutist, if the king had more personal power, Louis XVI may very well be able to avoid revolution altogether. Voltaire and other Enlightenment thinkers actually argue this very case. In Europe, if not in the young United States, Enlightenment monarchy is all the rage, and absolutist rulers like Prussian King Frederick the Great and Russian Empress Catherine the Great are seen not as tyrants, but as reformers, improving commerce, education, and culture in ways that are impossible in countries with powerful aristocracies. As for the powers Louis XVI does have, he often seems to cling too fiercely to them, to his own detriment and the detriment of his country. So before we dig into the beginnings of the French Revolution, I want to briefly discuss the man and the monarchy it's directed against. I also want to paint a picture of Louis' queen, Marie Antoinette, who features so prominently in this drama. Louis XVI takes the throne on May 10, 1774, at the age of 19. This is young for a head of state, but Louis XVI is actually the first French king in a while to take the throne as an adult. He succeeds his grandfather, Louis XV, who would become king at only five years old. Louis XV, in turn, had succeeded his own great-grandfather, Louis XIV, who had become king at the age of four and reigned for 72 years. Well, by comparison, Louis XVI is a breath of fresh air, able to take power right away instead of spending the first part of his reign under the eye of a regent. He's an Enlightenment monarch who seems to genuinely care about his subjects. In his royal decrees, he often opens by writing about how they will be good for the French people. I'll talk about his economic reforms in a minute since they tie directly into the revolution, but it's worth noting that he reestablishes religious tolerance in France permitting Protestant worship in the mostly Catholic country for the first time in 102 years. In foreign policy, he takes over at an interesting time. In 1774, France is 18 years removed from the diplomatic revolution. If you listen to my episodes on the Seven Years' War, you may remember that France had given up on its long-time enmity with Austria and entered into an Austrian alliance. Louis XVI maintains this alliance, mostly in an effort to thwart any British aims on the European continent. And if you listen to my episodes on the American Revolution, you'll remember that Louis XVI spends a great deal of French blood and treasure aiding the American revolutionaries, once again with the explicit aim of sticking his thumb in the British eye. In this, he is successful. But while the British lose the war and the Americans win, the French don't actually get much out of it. This is bad, because part of Foreign Minister Vergen's argument for getting involved in the American Revolution in the first place is that the French would take British colonies in India and maybe even reclaim French Canada so the war would pay for itself. Instead, France comes out of the war with nothing to show for it but more debt. And this plays into the financial situation we'll talk about in a few minutes. First, I want to talk a little bit about the other half of the royal couple. Four years prior to becoming king, 
at the age of 15, Louis had been married to 14-year-old Maria Antonia, better known by her French name Marie Antoinette, who is the daughter of another Enlightenment monarch, Archduchess Maria Theresa of Austria. Like most royal marriages in this day and age, this is an arranged match. But even by the standards of an arranged marriage, it starts off pretty badly. And by that, I mean that for the first seven years of the royal marriage, Louis XVI fails to get his wife pregnant. There are a number of theories as to why this might be. For one thing, the royal couple don't seem to get along well at first. The teenaged Louis is described as being cold to Marie Antoinette in public, which lends some credence to this claim. Another theory says that Louis has some kind of sexual dysfunction that prevents him from doing the deed, and there are even rumors that he's circumcised as a young adult to rectify this dysfunction, although these rumors have since been discredited. The most likely answer is the most obvious. In this era of arranged marriages, it's not at all uncommon for couples to go several years before consummating their marriage, particularly when the couple is married so young. Regardless, the couple's failure to conceive leads to widespread rumors amongst the French public, almost always blaming Marie Antoinette for her failure to bear their king and heir. Some say that she simply refuses to consummate the marriage, full stop. Others even allege that she is unfaithful to Louis. Now, much like the rumors of Louis's physical problems, these rumors are almost certainly false, and again, it's not unusual for couples this young to go several years before actually going to bed together, so the public anger is likely misdirected. The main reason Marie Antoinette is unpopular is far more prosaic. She's Austrian. At this time, the Austrian alliance has brought the French people nothing but trouble. To honor that alliance, they've recently fought in the Seven Years' War, where thousands of Frenchmen fought and died for no reason and no gain. Other than Great Britain, there's no country on earth that is less popular with the French populace than Austria. And Marie Antoinette isn't just any Austrian. As Louis XVI's bride, she is a living symbol of the hated alliance. No portrait of Marie Antoinette would be complete without describing one of history's most absurd political scandals. The Affair of the Diamond Necklace. Nowadays, we'd call it a nothing burger, but like many nothing burgers, it nonetheless has real ramifications. While Marie Antoinette is an innocent victim in the affair, the scandal has the ring of truth because she's already notorious for her extravagant spending. From 1774 to 1776, she spent 500,000 livres on a matching diamond bracelet and earrings from the famed Parisian jeweler Charles-Auguste Balmer. Converting this amount based on the spot price of gold, the cost was equivalent to more than $10 million in 2023 money. This far exceeded the Queen's allowance, and Charles Auguste Beaumaire ultimately goes to Louis XVI, who pays off 300,000 livres of the debt, while Marie Antoinette repays the rest over the course of a few years out of her own royal allowance, and she gives up buying new jewelry for a while. Surprisingly, The bracelets and earrings are far from the most expensive pieces Beaumaire has made for French royals. Back in 1772, he had created a diamond necklace worth an eye-watering 2 million livres, or $40 million using the same conversion method I used before. The 
necklace had multiple cascading chains with a total of 647 diamonds, making it one of the most opulent pieces of jewelry of all time. It was originally made for Louis XV's mistress, Madame du Berry, but upon the king's death, there was no longer a purchaser, and since Louis XV had never officially commissioned the necklace, Beaumaire had been forced to eat the cost. Given the high price of the necklace, it had ended up sitting in the jeweler's safe for years, awaiting a buyer. Beaumaire actually tries to sell the necklace to Louis XVI twice, and while the king is willing to buy it, Marie Antoinette refuses both times, saying that the state needs the money more. So again, while she is certainly an extravagant spender, she also seems to have some sense of proportion. Fast forward to ten years into Louis's reign as king in 1784, and we will meet a new character, Jeanne de Valois Saint-Rémy. Jeanne is a very distant descendant of former French King Henry II, whose reign ended way back in the 1540s. Her family has fallen on hard times since then, so much so that she ends up receiving a royal pension from a fund that was set up for indigent nobles. But Jeanne wants a more luxurious life, and goes to Versailles to request a larger pension on the basis of her royal blood. She already has a reputation for being a promiscuous con artist, so Marie Antoinette refuses to meet with her. This enrages Jeanne de Valois, who comes up with a plan to get rich at the Queen's expense. Jeanne's scheme relies on another desperate noble, Louis-René Edouard, better known as the Cardinal de Rohan. The Rohan clan is an old and influential one, and is connected to the royal family by a series of marriages. But much like the de Valois clan, it's no longer as wealthy as it once was, although the Cardinal does have some money in his personal fortune. Now, the Cardinal de Rohan is an ambitious man. He holds the position of court almoner, which is a respected post, but it really just means he's responsible for distributing the king's charitable contributions, and he hopes to rise to the much more prestigious position of prime minister, which importantly, is also far more lucrative. Unfortunately for him, Maria Theresa of Austria, Marie Antoinette's mother, has a grudge against the Rohan family for their role in fighting against the Austrians several times in the past. And Maria Theresa is constantly writing to Marie Antoinette about what an awful guy the Cardinal de Rohan supposedly is unless he can find some way to ingratiate himself with the queen, he has no chance of becoming prime minister. So, Jeanne de Valois arranges an introduction with the Cardinal de Rohan, and the two become friends. Some rumors say she even shares his bed from time to time. Jeanne convinces the Cardinal that not only is she a friend of Marie Antoinette's, but that she has put in a good word for him and the Queen wants to communicate with him. So the Cardinal de Rohan writes a letter to Marie Antoinette, and Jeanne de Valois convinces another one of her lovers, a Versailles guardsman named Reteau de Villette, to receive the Cardinal's letters and forge a response. This kicks off a phony correspondence between the Cardinal and the Queen, and the Queen convinces the Cardinal to give her a series of loans, ostensibly for charitable purposes. Needless to say, 
all of the money goes into Jean de Valois' pocket. Eventually, the Cardinal de Rohan begs to meet with Marie Antoinette in person. Now, such a request would trip up a lesser con artist, but Jean de Valois, whatever else you might think of her, is a master con artist. And she convinces the cardinal that while the queen also wants to meet with him, she's unwilling to do so openly because as far as the public and the rest of the court is concerned, she still hates him. Instead, they arrange a meeting at night in a botanical garden, and Jean hires a prostitute who kind of looks like Marie Antoinette to go to the meeting. Amazingly, the ruse is successful, and the cardinal is more convinced than ever that he's in the queen's good graces. In his book, Marie Antoinette, The Making of a French Queen, Scottish historian John Hardman tells us what happens next. Quote, Hitherto, Jean had merely extracted money from the cardinal. But now that he had swallowed the bait, she raised her sights. She would get hold of the fabulous necklace by convincing Beaumare that the queen had commissioned Rohan to buy it on her behalf. Rohan was provided with a forged memorandum and forged letter, purportedly from the queen, saying she wanted to purchase the necklace. But if she was temporarily short of funds, she was charging Rohan with handling the matter. She would be paying interest on the whole, whilst she discharged the capital in four payments, starting in July 1785. It was now January. If Beaumare and Rohan's judgments had not been affected by their different but equally parlous predicaments, they would have realized that the Queen's signature, Marie Antoinette de France, was not the one she used. She would have simply signed herself Marie Antoinette, just as the King signed Louis. But Beaumare didn't just rush into it. He told Rohan that he would have to square it with the banker Baudard de St. James, treasurer of the marine from whom he had borrowed 800,000 francs to construct the jewel. No one knew, but St. James himself was teetering on the brink of a spectacular bankruptcy that would rock the financial system a year later. St. James raised no objection and Beaumare handed over the necklace to the cardinal, who bore it in his carriage to the tiny apartment at Versailles that had been granted to Jeanne. There Rateau arrived, this time dressed in the queen's livery, to take the necklace, as Rohan supposed, straight to Marie Antoinette. As soon as the cardinal had left, Jeanne and her lover attacked the necklace with a kitchen knife, damaging some of the settings of the stones. Then Rateau proceeded to sell some of the individual diamonds to the various Parisian diamond merchants and pawnbrokers. They were suspicious, however, because he was offering them way below value and called the police. Rateau was detained and hauled before Jean-Charles Pierre Lenoir, the police minister himself. Rateau told Lenoir that he was acting on behalf of a woman of standing at court, Madame de la Comtesse de la Motte Valois. Jeanne had married a guardsman called La Motte, who fabricated the title of Comte. This was all technically true, and since no robbery had been reported, Rateau was released without charge. Meanwhile, the Comte de la Motte took the bulk of the diamonds to London to sell. The perfect crime. Lamotte got 300,000 livres for the diamonds, plus 8,000 pounds in objet de vertu from jewelers in New Bond Street in Piccadilly. Jean sold over 100,000 livres worth. This was a fortune for someone who had started life as a beggar. The Lamottes bought a substantial house in their province, filled it with bronzes and marbles, and entertained the local notables. Like many poor people who win the lottery, Jeanne had no idea of pacing her spending. 
One cloud hovered on the horizon. Rohan asked himself why the queen was not wearing the necklace. Not even on great feast days such as that of the Purification on February 2nd or Pentecost on May 24th. Because she had not yet plucked up the courage to tell Louis, Jean plausibly assured him. But the deadline approached for the first payment. Jean then said that the queen now found the necklace too expensive and would return it unless she had a 200,000 livres reduction. Reluctantly, Beaumaire agreed, but Rohan further insisted that Beaumaire should thank the queen. He wrote a note to this effect and found a chance of presenting it to her on July 12th, when returning the diamond to Paulitz, Louis had ordered for her to mark the baptism of his nephew, the Duc d'Algonquin, which had needed repairs. She was about to read the note when the finance minister Cologne entered and Beaumaire retired. After Cologne had gone, she read the note, but it was riddled with obsequiousness and worry, and the crucial reference to the necklace came at the end of the rambling missive. Mystified, Marie Antoinette either crumpled it up, accounts differ, or lit it with her silver gilt taper stick left burning on her desk, and refused Beaumaire's insistent pleas to grant her another audience. A crucial fortnight elapsed at the end of which the first installment was due. The Queen now proposed that she would increase the first payment to 700,000 livres, provided it could be paid on October 1st instead of August 1st. As a masterstroke, Jean then came up with 30,000 livres from the sale of the stones to cover the lost interest. Handing the sum over to Beaumaire on July 31st, Rohan egregiously lied in telling him that the queen herself personally had given him the 30,000 livres, which, a gratuitous embellishment, he said she had taken from a little porcelain secretaire by her fireplace. End quote. Despite his embellishments, the Cardinal de Rohan is now starting to suspect he's been conned. So he goes to visit a psychic who tells him that he has indeed become involved in a fraud. Rather than drag the royal family into the matter, he goes to the jeweler Beaumaire and promises to pay off the necklace himself. But the cardinal, while reasonably well off by the standards of everyday people, has nowhere near enough money to actually pay off this really expensive necklace. Beaumaire knows this and goes to Marie Antoinette himself to demand payment. The queen finally agrees to see him and then is surprised to say the least that she supposedly owes him all this money for a diamond necklace she has never seen. She tells Beaumaire that she never agreed to buy the necklace and that she certainly never received it. Beaumaire then goes to the Prime Minister, the Baron de Bretouy, to ask for advice, and Bretouy tells him to write a letter to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette formally accusing the Cardinal de Rohan of fraud. Bretouy also advises him not to mention Jean de Valois' part in the fraud because Rohan is his political rival and he wants the cardinal to look as guilty as possible. Louis XVI then has the cardinal arrested in the Palace of Versailles' famous Gallery of Mirrors, and the public arrest becomes the talk of all Paris. The cardinal, in turn, accuses Jean de Valois of fraud. Guilty only of being a gullible idiot, de Rohan is ultimately acquitted, although he loses his post as almoner, and Jean de Valois is found guilty. She is branded with the letter V, which stands for thief in French, and is condemned to spend the rest of her life in a prostitute's prison although she ultimately escapes and flees to London, where she writes a memoir in which she stands by her claim that Marie Antoinette herself ordered the necklace. 
despite the fact that the queen had nothing to do with the affair of the diamond necklace, other than having her name dragged through the mud, many in the French public believe the accusations against her, which only enhances her reputation as an unreliable, out-of-touch spendthrift. That's just how politics goes sometimes. As I mentioned, the French government is in a terrible financial state in the 1780s. This is largely because of all the military spending in the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, but that is only one side of the story. In addition to excessive spending, the French state is also hobbled by an archaic tax system that's needed reform for a while, and this is causing trouble on the revenue side of the balance sheet. To begin with, while the king can spend the state's money however he wants and can even borrow money, he can't levy taxes on his own. But unlike in Great Britain, where Parliament sets tax policy for the entire country, French taxes can be levied only with the permission of 17 regional parlements, or courts of appeal. These are not elected bodies like the British Parliament. Uh, the Parlement are gatherings of nobles who make legal rulings. And since each of these Parlements makes its own decisions, there is no unified French tax code. In theory, the king can levy a national tax, but he can only do this with the approval of the Estates General, a legislative body that hasn't met since way back in 1614. We'll get back to them in a few minutes. If the 17 regional parlements aren't enough, France is also divided into 39 administrative divisions, each of which has its own royal governor and separate tax privileges, and the boundaries of which don't correspond to the 17 regions. When he took the throne in 1774, Louis XVI had appointed a new finance minister, a man named Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot. Turgot believed in an economic theory called physiocracy, which holds that the real value in an economy is in the land. This is different from the prevailing mercantilist theory of the time, which holds that a strong economy depends on a positive balance of trade, and it's different from modern capitalist theory, which holds that a strong economy depends on specialization and division of labor. To improve the value of French land, Turgot reduced taxes and tried to implement a free trade system by eliminating government caps on the price of grain. His grain reforms were popular with rural peasants who were able to raise their prices, but they were unpopular with the urban population and even sparked riots in Paris. He reduced the national debt by taking out low-interest loans to pay off older, higher-interest loans and nearly balance the budget. One of Turgot's most popular moves was the abolition of the corvée, which was a 15-day period during which peasants must perform unpaid labor for their feudal overlords, time almost always spent in the building of roads. In his preamble to the measure abolishing the corvée, Turgot wrote, quote, With the exception of a small number of provinces, nearly all the roads of the kingdom have been built by the unpaid labor of the poorest part of our subjects. The whole burden has therefore fallen on those who have nothing but their hands, and are interested only in a very secondary degree in the roads. Those really interested are the landowners almost all of them privileged persons, the value of whose property is increased by the roads. When the poor man alone is forced to maintain these roads, when he is forced to give his time and his work without pay, the only resource he has against misery and hunger is taken from him to make him work for the profit of the rich. End quote. 
the Parlement of Paris, the nation's most powerful Parlement, which is made up, again, I remind you, entirely of nobles, well, they initially refused to go along with the abolishment of the corvée. And Turgot then wrote a public letter, quote, While as unfriendly to despotism as ever, I shall say constantly to the king, to the parlement, and, if necessary, to the whole nation, that this is one of those matters that must be decided by the absolute will of the king, and for this reason. At bottom, this is a lawsuit between the rich and the poor. Now, of what is the parlement made up? Of men wealthy as compared with the masses and all noble, since their offices carry nobility. The court, whose clamor is so powerful, of what is it composed? Of great lords, the majority of whom own estates that will be subject to the tax. Consequently, neither the remonstrance of the Parlement, nor even the clamor of the court, should in any wise prejudice the case. So long as the people shall have no voice in the Parlement, The king, after hearing these, must judge for himself, and he must judge in favor of the people, for this class is the most unhappy. In one of his rare displays of strength, Louis XVI summoned the Parlement of Paris to Versailles and forced them to approve the edict, saying, I see well that there is no one here but Monsieur Turgot and myself who loves the people. Unfortunately, Turgot's reforms turned the aristocracy against him, and when he also pressured Marie Antoinette to curtail her extravagant lifestyle for the benefit of the state, she in turn asked Louis to dismiss him, which Louis did in the summer of 1776. Turgot is briefly replaced by a nobleman named Cluny de Nuy, who re-establishes the corvée and serves for only a few months before being replaced in turn by a Protestant Swiss banker named Jacques Necker, who tries to re-implement many of Turgot's reforms. Necker is popular with the lower classes and imposes some small taxes on the nobility while convincing Louis XVI to abolish serfdom in France. However, with France now embroiled in the American Revolution, he has no choice but to float a series of loans to fund the military. Necker continuously warns Louis XVI of the danger of taking out more loans, saying that the interest will bankrupt the country. So Louis fires him in 1781, and he's succeeded by three more finance ministers whose names I won't bother you with because they're not important. Suffice it to say that none of them are able to solve France's fiscal problems without raising taxes, and the Parlement and nobility stymie them at every turn. The last of these men even tries to pay off debt by devaluing French coinage, which causes a bout of hyperinflation that hits the poor hardest of all and leads to urban bread riots in late 1787 and early 1788. In August of 1788, Louis XVI summons Necker back to his post. But by now, even the brilliant Swiss banker can't devise a way to pay off France's debt without raising new taxes. These taxes include a Stamp Act, similar to the one in the American colonies, as well as a new land tax. But once again, the Parlement refuse to give their approval. Louis XVI even summons the Parlement of Paris, the largest and most powerful Parlement, to the palace at Versailles to demand that they approve these taxes. But they refuse. Instead, they insist on calling the Estates General, uh, which, as you'll remember, is that legislative body that hasn't met in over 150 years. It may sound weird that the aristocracy is insisting on the meeting of a legislative body, 
but they're pushing back at the king's power and the idea of an absolute monarchy. And due to the estate's general's unique makeup, the noble class hopes to be able to dominate any debate. How would this work, you might ask? To understand why, we need to talk about how French society is structured in the late 1700s. In 1789, French society is still organized according to the old feudal system. In this context and the context of the estates general, the word estates refers to the three feudal classes, or estates. In the traditional framing, these are the clergy, or those who pray, the nobility, or those who fight, and the peasantry, or those who work. When the estates general meet, each estate will have its own set of deputies to represent their interests. Unfortunately for the French people, the royal couple, and much of Europe, all three of the old feudal estates are in bad shape. Let's take a look at each of them and how they function, or more often than not, fail to function, in French society. The first estate, the clergy, makes up about half a percent of French society and owns about 10% of the land. Some of that land consists of things like local churches and cemeteries, but the bulk of it consists of estates belonging to bishops. These estates are normally rented out in parcels to peasant farmers, and the church pays no taxes on the rent, although as a matter of policy, the French bishops provide interest-free loans to the state. However, in addition to rent, the church also collects a 10% tithe, or church tax, which is ostensibly used to fund the church's operations, but in practice, almost all of that money goes to the bishops, who live lavish lifestyles while local parishes are chronically underfunded. This isn't an accident. In France, unlike in most Catholic countries, the bishops and the local parish priests are entirely different classes of people. Way back in 1515, King Francis I had negotiated the right to appoint French bishops, rather than having them appointed by the Pope. This is designed to provide desirable posts for French nobles who might otherwise become unruly, but it has disastrous consequences. Now, I get annoyed when people say things like, in medieval Europe this, or in Renaissance China that, as if you can generalize about an entire continent over a period of hundreds of years, but in medieval Renaissance and, to a lesser extent, Enlightenment-era Europe, the Catholic Church is more than just a religious organization. There are no or few social welfare programs in most countries, and those functions are instead handled by the Church. If, for example, a peasant has a bad harvest or a sudden unexpected expense, like, you know, they need to buy a new plow or something, they can turn to their local parish priest for help. In France in the 1780s, though, that local parish priest is often as poor as their poorest congregants. So not only is the social safety net broken, but the priests themselves often need help from their congregation over and above the 10% tithe. Another related issue is that French society is still highly stratified, at least more so than in Britain and most Protestant countries. They've even had feudal serfs tied to the land until just a few years ago. In these stratified societies, the church is one of the few ways for an ordinary peasant to rise through the ranks. 
If you're a reasonably clever young man, you can enroll in a seminary, learn to read, and become a priest. From there, you can work your way up to bishop and other important positions in the country. Likewise, young women can join a convent, and if they do well, they can become abbess of that convent, often reporting directly to the Pope. In this way, the Church has often acted as a pressure release valve that allows a degree of social mobility for the most intelligent, capable people of any class. In France, with the king filling all the powerful positions with nobles, there is no pressure release valve. This goes to explain a lot of the apparent contradictions of the French Revolution. Your average French person has nothing but justified disdain for their local bishop, who may be some guy from the other side of the country who's never even been to their diocese. But that same French person, on average, is nonetheless religious and maintains a close connection to their local parish priest. When we get to the height of the revolution, the most radical leaders will misread the situation and launch an all-out assault on the entire priesthood, and they will be totally blindsided by the public backlash. But that's later. For now, we have a first estate that is ostensibly united, but is in fact sharply divided between a handful of wealthy bishops and the large body of poor local priests. Keep that in mind, because it's going to be important once the voting starts in the Estates General. The second estate, the nobility, makes up 1.5% of the French population and owns around 25% of the land. Unlike the clergy, nobles are subject to some taxes. To begin with, they pay a 5% income tax. Although some regions are exempt and many individual nobles have paid a one-time fee to purchase an exemption from the income tax. As with the bishop's estates, noble estates are mostly leased out to farmers and the land itself is mostly exempt from taxes. I say mostly because while hereditary noble estates are not taxable, a lot of nobles have purchased land belonging to commoners, and since the taxes are attached to the land and not to the owner's title, land purchased from commoners is still subject to a property tax. But once again, there are numerous local exceptions, as well as personal exemptions that have been purchased or negotiated by individual nobles or noble families. You can see why the French tax system is kind of a mess. Regardless, the effective tax rate on the nobility is far lower than the taxes paid by peasants, although they still pay more into the treasury than the clergy does. Much like the clergy, there are poor nobles as well as wealthy ones. It's entirely possible for a noble family to squander all of their wealth while still retaining their titles. That's exactly what happened to Jean de Valois' family back in the day, which partially explains why she turned into a con artist and kicked off the affair of the diamond necklace. As a matter of fact, the Older noble families are more likely to be poor because they've been around longer and, well, it only takes one incompetent generation to screw everything up. These older families are called the nobility of the sword because their titles date back to the days when nobles were expected to maintain a contingent of knights and contribute directly to the military. At the same time, a number of French nobles are either from the lower classes or descended from lower class people not all that long ago. And by lower class, I mean wealthy merchants and professionals, uh, so people with plenty of money but no title to go along with it. Referred to as the nobility of the robe, 
These newer nobles have purchased their titles in order to gain access to power and more money and to the tax exemptions that come with noble titles. And because of this, most of these families are still wealthy. And this causes a bit of a divide in the second estate because nobles of the robe are almost universally conservative. They've spent a fortune to gain their titles and they want to reap the benefits. They are generally the strongest supporters of things like the corvée and higher taxes on the common people with carve-outs and exceptions for the nobility. Meanwhile, many nobles of the sword, both rich and poor, have more liberal politics. And as a matter of fact, many of the early revolutionary leaders come from the nobility of the sword. The third estate, the peasantry, includes everyone who isn't in the clergy or nobility. This is around 98% of the population and owns around 65% of French land. Most of these people are rural farmers, most of whom, around 80%, are poor enough that they rent their holdings from nobles or clergymen or wealthier commoners. More well-to-do farmers own their own land, and then some even own enough land to rent parcels out to the poorer peasants. The third estate also includes a small but growing class of urban laborers who work in France's small but growing industrial sector. It even includes people like bankers, lawyers, and merchants who are financially well-off but hold no noble titles. This professional class is known as the bourgeoisie and will come to dominate revolutionary politics. As for taxes, the common people pay a lot of them. To begin with, peasants who rent their land from nobles are often subjected to old feudal duties such as the hated corvée. But even if you're lucky and industrious and save up enough money to buy your own farm, you're not out of the woods yet. All land not owned by nobility or the church is subject to property tax. So whatever you save by not paying rent often goes to the king instead. Beyond that, there's a tax on salt, which once again the nobility and the church are exempt from. And in these days, salt goes in everything. Remember, these are the days before refrigeration and canning. When you preserve food, particularly meat, it is cured in salt. So it's not like you can just avoid the stuff. It's basically the only preservative people have at this time. As with so many things in the Ancien Regime... The salt tax is set at different rates in different regions, with exceptions and adjustments for many localities. So it's not uncommon for one farmer's salt tax to be downright punitive while his neighbor pays a small nominal rate. Finally, common people have to pay excise taxes on pretty much everything. Want to buy some paper to write a letter? Pay the tax. Tobacco to take the edge off? Pay the tax. Tea, wool, or cotton? All taxed. You name it, if it isn't made in your local area, there's an excise tax. In theory, these taxes protect local producers from competition. But in practice, they can do as much harm as good even to the producers. For example, take your local blacksmith. You visit him to buy a shovel, and there's theoretically no excise tax. But unless you happen to live next door to an iron mine, the blacksmith is buying the iron for that shovel from somewhere else and paying an excise tax on that iron, which gets passed on to you in the form of higher prices. Like the salt tax, excise taxes are highly variable depending on where you live and what types of goods are being taxed. Furthermore, 
excise taxes are charged when goods transit across different jurisdictions. It's not unheard of for excise taxes to be charged a dozen or more times on the same product. And, well, since taxes are charged each time they cross from one jurisdiction to another, uh, people closest to the outside of the country pay lower taxes and people closer to the center of France pay more taxes because anything that's being imported has to cross more French jurisdictions before it gets to them. All of this to say that 18th century France has a regressive tax system, with the poorest citizens paying the lion's share of the taxes. And if that's not bad enough, there are no government tax collectors. Instead, like in the old Roman Empire, taxes are collected by private contractors who are paid a percentage of whatever they collect. Unscrupulous tax collectors are known to overcharge innumerate peasants who don't know any better. And it's not unheard of for tax collectors to visit the same people again and again. Anyone who doesn't save their receipts, they're liable to get double or triple taxed. I've talked about the division between the bishops and parish priests in the first estate and the division between nobles of the robe and nobles of the sword in the second estate. But I really want to focus on the divisions in the third estate because there's a lot going on here. And if you want to understand the French Revolution, it's super important to understand the third estate. To begin with, for those of you who listened to my episodes on the American Revolution, the sizes of the French population and the American population don't even compare. On the eve of the American Revolution, the population of the 13 North American colonies is around 2.5 million, including around half a million slaves. Add that to a British population of around 8 million, and you get a total of 10.5 million people. By contrast, the French population in 1789 is approximately 28 million. And while most of the British population is able to sit out the American Revolution in relative peace, almost all 28 million French people are going to be involved in the French Revolution in one way or another, whether they want to be or not. In other words, it's a much bigger conflict. Not only that, but compared to Britain... French society is very agrarian, and it's only just beginning to industrialize. There are significant differences between the rural and urban populations, and these are worth looking at. In their book, Rousseau and the Revolution, The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, American historians Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, The majority of the peasant proprietors who tilled 45% of the soil were condemned to poverty by the small size of their holdings, which limited the profitable use of machinery. Agricultural technology in France lagged behind that of England. There were schools of agriculture and model farms, but only a few farmers took advantage of them. Probably 60% of the peasant proprietors owned less than the five hectares, about 13 acres, needed to support a family, and the men were driven to hire themselves out as laborers on large farms. Wages of farm laborers rose 12% between 1771 and 1789, but in the same period, prices rose 65% or more. While agricultural production rose during the reign of Louis XVI, the hired laborers grew poorer and formed a rural proletariat which, in times of slack employment, served as a breeding ground for a multitude of beggars and vagabonds. Chamfort thought it incontestable that there are in France seven million men who beg alms 
and 12 million who are unable to give alms. Probably the poverty of the peasants was exaggerated by travelers because they noticed chiefly the visible conditions, and did not see the currency and goods concealed to avoid the eye of the tax assessor. Contemporary estimates conflict. Arthur Young found areas of poverty, brutality, and filth, as in Brittany, and areas of prosperity and pride, as in Bayarn. By and large, poverty in rural France in 1789 was not as bad as in Ireland, no worse than in Eastern Europe, or in the slums of some affluent cities in our time, but worse than in England or in the ever-bountiful valley of the Po. The latest studies indicate that there was, at the end of the old regime, an agrarian crisis. When drought and famine came, as in 1788-89, to the sufferings of the peasantry, particularly in the south of France, were such that only the charities distributed by the government and the clergy kept half the population from starving. End quote. The conditions of the urban population are a bit more complex, but ultimately paint a similar picture of poverty. In the next chapter of their book, Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, Domestic industry, of men, women, and children in the home, served merchants who provided the material and bought the product. Guilds masters, journeymen, and apprentices produced handicraft goods, chiefly for local needs. The guilds survived till the revolution, but by 1789 they had been fatally weakened by the growth of capitalistic free enterprise. Companies free to collect capital from any one source, to hire anybody, to invent and apply new methods of production and distribution, to compete with anybody, and to sell anywhere. These establishments were usually small, but they were multiplying. So Marseille alone, in 1789, had 38 soap factories, 48 for hats, 8 for glass, 12 sugar refineries, 10 tanneries. In textiles, building, mining, and metallurgy, capitalism had expanded into large-scale enterprises, usually through joint stock companies, societies, and a name. France was slow to adopt the textile machines that were inaugurating the Industrial Revolution in England, but large textile factories were operating in Abbeville, Amiens, Reims, Paris, Louvière, and Orléans and the silk industry flourished at Lyon. The building trades were raising those massive blocks of apartment houses that still give French cities their characteristic physiognomy. Shipbuilding employed thousands of workers in Nantes, Bordeaux, Marseille. Mining was the most advanced of French industries. The state kept all rights to the subsoil, leased the mines to concessionaires, and enforced a code of safety for the miners. Companies sank shafts to depths of 300 feet, installed expensive equipment for ventilation, drainage, and transport, and made millionaires. The Anzon firm had 4,000 workmen, 600 horses, and 12 steam engines, and mined 310 tons of coal per year. The mining of iron and other metals supplied materials for an expanding metallurgical industry. In 1787, the Crusoe Stock Company raised 10 million livres of capital to apply the latest machinery in the production of ironware. Steam engines operated bellows, hammers, and drills, and railways enabled one horse to pull what had required five horses before. Some startling inventions were developed by Frenchmen in these years. In 1776, the Marquis de Geoffroy d'Abon amused crowds along the River Doube with a sidewheeler boat propelled by a steam engine, 31 years before Fulton's Clermont steamed up and down the Hudson. In the cities and towns, a proletariat was taking form. Men, women, and children working for wages with tools and materials not their own. 
There are no statistics of them, but they have been estimated for the Paris of 1789 at 75,000 families or 300,000 individuals. And there were proportionate masses in Abbeville, Lyon, and Marseille. Hours of work were long and wages were low. For a ruling of the Paris Parlement, November 12, 1778, forbade the workers to organize. Between 1741 and 1789, wages rose 22%. Prices, 65%. The condition of the workers seems to have deteriorated in the reign of Louis XVI. When demand slackened, or, as in 1786, foreign competition became severe, working men in great number were discharged and became a burden on charity. The rise in the price of bread, which constituted half the food of the Parisian populace, put thousands of families close to starvation. At Lyon in 1787, 30,000 persons were on public relief. At Reims in 1788, after an inundation, two-thirds of the population were destitute. At Paris in 1791, a hundred thousand families were listed as indigent. In Paris, wrote Mercier around 1785, the common people are weak, pallid, diminutive, stunted, and apparently a class apart from other classes in the state. Riots against the cost of living occurred sporadically throughout the second half of the 18th century. In Normandy, there were six between 1752 and 1768. In 1768, the rioters captured control of Rouen, sacked the public granaries, pillaged the stores. Similar riots occurred at Reims in 1770, Poitiers in 1772, Dijon, Versailles, Paris, Pontois in 1775, Aix en Provence in 1785, and again at Paris in 1788 and 1789. End quote. Finally, it's worth taking a quick look at the bourgeoisie, the professional and merchant class whose conditions are so different from the rest of the common folk that they may as well be their own estate. Moving on to Will and Ariel Durant's next chapter, quote, Industrial, colonial, and other enterprises required capital and generated a spreading breed of bankers. Joint stock companies offered shares. The government floated loans. Speculation developed in the sale and purchase of securities. Speculators hired journalists to disseminate rumors designed to raise or lower the price of stocks. Members of the ministries joined in the speculation, and so became subject to pressure or influence by the bankers. Every war made the state more dependent on the financiers, and made the financiers more vitally concerned with the policy and solvency of the state. Some bankers enjoyed a personal credit superior to that of the government. Hence, they could borrow at a low rate, lend to the government at a higher rate, and increase their wealth merely by bookkeeping, provided their judgment was good and the state paid its debts. If we take together merchants, manufacturers, financiers, inventors, engineers, scientists, minor bureaucrats, clerks, tradesmen, chemists, artists, booksellers, teachers, writers, physicians, and untitled lawyers and magistrates as constituting the bourgeoisie, we can understand how by 1789 it had become the richest and most energetic part of the nation. It probably owned as much rural land as the nobility and it could acquire nobility merely by buying a noble fief or a post as one of the many secretaries to the king. While the nobility lost numbers and wealth through idleness, extravagance, and biological decay, the clergy lost ground through the rise of science, philosophy, and an urban Epicurean life and code, the middle classes grew in money and power by the development of industry, technology, commerce, and finance. 
They filled with their products or imports the boutiques or stores, whose splendor astonished foreign visitors to Paris, Lyon, Reims, or Bordeaux. While wars were bankrupting the government, they enriched the bourgeoisie, which provided transport and material. The growing prosperity was almost confined to the towns. It eluded the peasantry and the proletariat, and appeared most visibly in merchants and financiers. In 1789, 40 French merchants had a combined wealth of 60 million livres, and one banker, Paris Montmartel, amassed 100 million. The essential cause of the revolution was the disparity between economic reality and political forms, between the importance of the bourgeoisie in the production and possession of wealth and its exclusion from governmental power. The upper middle class was conscious of its abilities and sensitive to its slights. It was galled by the social exclusiveness and insolence of the nobility, as when the brilliant Madame Roland, invited to stay for dinner in an aristocratic home, found herself served in the servants' quarters. It saw the nobility milking the coffers of the state for extravagant expenditures and feasts while denying political or military office or promotion to those very men whose inventive enterprise had expanded the tax-yielding economy of France and whose savings were now supporting the treasury. End quote. To recap, France is on the verge of bankruptcy, new taxes need to be levied, and only the estates general has the authority to approve them. Each estate, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people, will elect a group of delegates. The first and second estates will elect one delegate for each administrative district, while the common people will elect two. Because the type of administrative district is different for each estate, the numbers don't entirely match up. There are 308 delegates for the first estate, 285 for the second estate, and 621 for the third estate. This might seem to allow a more or less fair vote, but the Estates General is yet another one of France's old feudal institutions. Instead of being built on the Enlightenment principle of individual rights, it's built on the medieval principle of group rights. So instead of all the delegates voting on propositions, each estate's delegates vote separately, and each estate collectively gets one vote. This is a big part of why the third estate shoulders so many tax burdens to begin with. Even when the estates general used to meet regularly, the clergy and the nobility routinely defeated the common people by banding together and producing a two-to-one final vote in favor of the ruling classes. Even within the third estate, most of the Paris population are left out of the voting by income requirements. Parisians are only allowed to vote if they pay at least six livres in taxes, which means that only the bourgeoisie are actually able to cast a ballot. By contrast, the rest of France has only a bare minimum income requirement, so all but the very poorest people are able to vote, although fewer than 10% of their delegates are farmers and almost half are lawyers. Part of this is classism, but a bigger part is purely practical. Lawyers are universally literate, while most farmers are not, and literacy is a requirement to serve in the estates general. More to the point, the delegates have to pay their own way. If you're a successful lawyer, you can afford to take some time off work and go to Paris. The same can't be said for a farmer. But even if there are no Explicitly classist intentions, the end result is a third estate body that's far more urban, wealthy, and educated than the French population writ large. It's also worth noting that members of the nobility are not required to stand for election to the second estate. In fact, many are not allowed to. 
The law forbids nobles from serving as second estate delegates unless their family has been noble for four generations and a hundred years. So, many nobles instead stand for election as third estate delegates. These include the famous Comte de Mirabeau, one of the most important figures of the early revolution. Louis XVI officially calls for elections on January 24, 1789. In addition to electing a delegate, each estate in each district is also invited to write what is called a cahier de plaintes et doléances, a statement of complaints and grievances, which is meant to guide the deputy for that district. The local cahiers are then condensed into provincial cahiers, which are then further summarized and delivered to the king prior to the meeting of the estates general. Each estate has its own set of grievances. The first estate, the clergy, call for an end to the toleration of Protestants, an end to the freedom of the press, and for the Catholic Church to have exclusive control of the education of French children. But cracks are beginning to form. While abbots and bishops and other higher-ranking clergy emphasize the Church's independence, many of the rural priests instead call for more of the tithe to be left to the parishes rather than handed over to the bishops. The second estate, the nobility, calls for the return of the feudal rights that had been abolished by Louis XIII's Prime Minister Cardinal Richelieu in the 1600s, such as the right to maintain military defenses that could, in theory, be used against the king. The third estate, the people, demands an end to the nobility's remaining feudal rights, including the exclusive right to hunt game, which is hated by the farmers. Imagine, for example, that a bunch of deer are eating your crops, which is your livelihood, but you're not allowed to do anything about it because those deer belong to the local lord. The third estate also demands that all government posts be open to all French subjects based on their abilities, rather than all of the high offices being restricted to nobility. One typical third estate cahier reads, quote, we are the principal prop of the throne, the true support of the armies. We are the source of riches for others, and we ourselves remain in poverty. End quote. At the same time, there is a surprising amount of agreement between the three estates. All of them call for a constitutional monarchy with clearly delineated royal powers and not one of them recognizes the king's divine right to rule, which has long been a claim of French royalty, although all estates still do proclaim loyalty to the king. The three estates call for the right to trial by a jury, and also for an end to the practice of the king's postal agents reading their mail. Perhaps most surprisingly, all of the estates say that they agree to the equal taxation of all land, which would not only make the tax system fairer, but would also go a long way towards balancing the budget. And by the way, I am grossly generalizing here. We've already talked about disagreements within the individual estates, and those differences are reflected in the various cahiers. Finally, there is a controversy over how the estates are going to vote. In the past, the three estates had all elected a single delegate per district, but Enlightenment thinkers and advocates for the third estate had developed a slogan, Double the third, vote by head. At Finance Minister Necker's urging, King Louis had agreed the first part, double the third, which is why the third estate elects two delegates per district instead of one. But the second part, uh, vote by head, meaning that all delegates should have an equal vote, uh, this is still a sticking point. So while each estate will get one vote 
to start with, the issue is still controversial. Worse, when Louis kicks the can down the road, he leaves the matter of voting by head up to the estate's general to decide, which is well, something that will lead directly to the beginning of revolution. No discussion of the French Revolution would be complete without talking about the political clubs that have popped up all over Paris in the late 1700s. These clubs are basically cafes where people go to drink coffee and talk about politics, and individual clubs have their own political leanings. The Paris clubs play into a theory I read somewhere. I can't remember where I read it, and maybe it was a joke, uh, but the theory goes that the introduction of coffee into Europe created the Enlightenment and led to the spread of democracy. Basically, instead of going out to the pub and getting smashed every night, people are drinking coffee and talking politics, and the next morning they can actually remember what they talked about the night before. I don't have any proof, but it's an interesting enough theory that I thought I'd mention it. Anyway, these political clubs are popping up like mushrooms, and it would be impossible to talk about all of them. But before we get to the meeting of the Estates General, there are two clubs in particular that are worth mentioning. The first of these clubs is the Breton Club, which meets at the Café Amory near Versailles. Breton refers to the region of Brittany in far western France, where low-level violence has already broken out over bread prices and other issues. Prior to elections for the Estates General, the Breton nobility and senior clergy had demanded the right to elect their own representatives and deny the franchise to parish priests and the entire Third Estate. The Third Estate had elected delegates anyway, as had the lower-ranking clergy. In protest, the nobility and senior clergy had refused to send delegates to the Estates General altogether, which seems counterproductive, but whatever. Anyway, the Breton delegates are among the most radical reformists, and will be on the bleeding edge of revolutionary thought right up through the days of the infamous Reign of Terror. Later in 1789, the Breton Club will relocate to a rented Dominican monastery on the Rue de saint Honore. At the time, the Dominicans are known as Jacobins in France, leading to the Breton Club being renamed as the Jacobin Club, which we'll be talking about a whole lot in later episodes. The other club worth mentioning is Les Trente, literally meaning the Thirty, but usually translated to English as the Society of Thirty. The name is inaccurate anyway, since the total membership hovers at around 55 men. The Society of Thirty is founded in the first week of November 1788 by a Paris nobleman and soon-to-be second estate delegate named Adrien Jean-Francois Duport. Duport is a political moderate and seeks to build a party of national unity based around what will soon be called a conspiracy of decent men. The Society of Thirty includes a number of men who will be influential in the revolutionary government. You don't have to remember all of these names right now, but I will quickly introduce a few of the most important ones. To begin with, there is Charles-Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord, better known to history as Talleyrand, although his political opponents will call him Le Diable Boiteau, or the Lame Devil, due to a limp he developed as a child. Talleyrand is one of those noblemen who gets to be on the fast track to become a bishop, and in January of 1789, mere months before the opening of the Estates General, he is appointed Bishop of Autun in eastern France at the age of 34. 
Despite being a bishop and a delegate for the first estate, Talleyrand is a liberal who supports some of the strongest anti-clerical measures, including the abolition of the tithe, the seizure of church property, and, as we'll discuss in later episodes, the establishment of a parallel French church that sits outside of the established Catholic hierarchy. He also breaks with most of his fellow clerics by supporting a national system of secular schools and even allowing Jews to vote. He'll pop up a few times in our story and is ultimately best known to history for his work as one of the most accomplished diplomats ever, both during the Revolution and later under Napoleon. The second notable member of the Society of Thirty is none other than Marie-Joseph Paul-Yves Roche-Gilbert de Motier de Lafayette, better known simply as the Marquis de Lafayette. Already famous as a hero of the American Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette is a moderate who supports liberal political reforms but wants to maintain a constitutional monarchy similar to Great Britain's. He will be a major figure in the early days of the French Revolution before his moderate beliefs put him out of favor with the more radical revolutionaries and he's forced into exile. He will then spend some time as a political prisoner before retiring from politics during Napoleon's reign, only to return during the Bourbon Restoration, where he will continue to be a voice for liberty even as the later French kings reverse many of the revolution's liberal reforms. But all of that is in the future. For now, he's a delegate for the Second Estate and hopes to liberalize French society while pushing back against the more radical politicians. The third man I want to introduce is Maximilien Robespierre, who will become one of the prime instigators of the Reign of Terror. He's one of the revolution's most fascinating and controversial figures, and we'll spend most of a later episode talking about him, so I will keep this short and sweet. Robespierre is a lawyer by trade and has written a number of liberal political tracts throughout the 1780s. He serves as a delegate for the Third Estate from Pas de Calais on France's Atlantic coast and will soon leave the Society of Thirty to join the more radical Jacobin Club. As I said, Robespierre is a huge figure later on, so we will talk about him then. Next on our list of notable members of the Society of Thirty is Honor Gabriel Riquetti the Comte de Mirabeau, usually just called Mirabeau. Mirabeau is one of those nobles of the robe I talked about. His great-grandfather, an Italian merchant, had purchased a noble title in 1685, but to most of the French nobility, the Riquetti family is still considered to be new blood, and therefore not quite as noble as the nobles of the sword. As a child, Mirabeau suffers from smallpox, which leaves his face badly scarred. Despite this, he seems to have a way with the ladies, and after entering the army as a young man, he's soon imprisoned for seducing the wife of his commanding officer. Upon his release, he serves with distinction in the invasion of Corsica, while simultaneously getting involved in another torrid and public love affair. Eventually he settles down, but his first wife is such a prolific spender that he's soon forced into bankruptcy, after which she obtains an annulment. Mirabeau then gets into a fight with another man that lands him in prison, but he escapes, remarries, and moves to the Netherlands, where he makes a living as an author of pulp novels before being rearrested by French authorities and sent back to prison where he puts his writing talents to work on an essay called Des Lettres de Cachet et des Prisons d'État, 
which is a widely regarded protest against lettres de cachet, which are legal documents the French kings can use to imprison anyone at any time for any reason. And it's this essay that truly brings Mirabeau to public attention. Upon his release in 1782, he spends the rest of the 1780s as a political writer and quickly becomes famous throughout France. Denied the right to stand for election as a delegate for the second estate, Mirabeau is instead elected as a delegate for the third estate. A conservative who nonetheless believes that the Ancien Regime needs reform, he is one of the leading figures of the early revolution. The last person I want to touch on here is Emmanuel Joseph Sié, known to history as the Abbé Sié. Sié is the son of a tax collector, which makes him a well-to-do commoner. As a young man, he receives a Jesuit education and his dreams of becoming a soldier. Those dreams are crushed by perennial poor health, so instead he follows the advice of his very religious parents who convince him to become a priest. As a seminarian, he barely passes his theology classes and instead spends most of his time studying science and politics. Originally conservative in his beliefs, C.A. becomes disillusioned by the ease with which nobles are able to advance within the church hierarchy, and when elections for the estates general are announced, he stands for election not as a member of the clergy, but as a member of the third estate from the Paris delegation. While he will contribute a great deal to the revolution, he's perhaps best well known for his writing. In the run-up to the meeting of the estates general, C.A. publishes a best-selling pamphlet called What is the Third Estate? The most famous passage from What is the Third Estate is the opening paragraph, where C.A. writes, quote, What is the Third Estate? Everything. What has it been until now in the political order? Nothing. What does it want to be? Something. End quote. This is a good summary of C.A.'s beliefs, but the first chapter goes much further and forms the intellectual basis not just for the French Revolution, but for the revolutionary ideal of French nationalism, which, as we'll see, is the foundation of modern nationalism just about everywhere. Since nationalism is the theme of this season of relevant history, it's appropriate to read this passage in full. C.A. writes, quote, What does a nation require to survive and prosper? It needs private activities and public services. These private activities can all be comprised within four classes of persons. 1. Since land and water provide the basic materials for human needs, the first class, in logical order, includes all the families connected with work on the land. 2. Between the initial sale of goods and the moment when they reach the consumer or user, goods acquire an increased value of a more or less compound nature through the incorporation of varying amounts of labors. In this way, human industry manages to improve the gifts of nature and the value of the raw material may be multiplied twice or tenfold or a hundredfold. Such are the activities of the second class of persons. 3. Between production and consumption, as also between the various stages of production, a variety of intermediary agents intervene to help producers as well as consumers. These are the dealers and the merchants. Merchants continually compare needs according to place and time and estimate the profits to be obtained from warehousing and transportation. Dealers undertake, in the final stage, to deliver the goods on the wholesale and retail markets. Such is the function of the third class of persons. Four. 
Besides these three classes of useful and industrious citizens who deal with things fit to be consumed or used, society also requires a vast number of special activities and of services directly useful or pleasant to the person. This fourth class embraces all sorts of occupations, from the most distinguished liberal and scientific professions to the lowest of menial tasks. Such are the activities which support society. But who performs them? The third estate. Public services can also at present be divided into four known categories. The army, the law, the church, and the bureaucracy. It needs no detailed analysis to show that the third estate everywhere constitutes 19 twentieths of them, except that it is loaded with all the really arduous work, all the tasks which the privileged order refuses to perform. Only the well-paid and honorific posts are filled by members of the privileged order. Are we to give them credit for this? We could do so only if the third estate was unable or unwilling to fill these posts. We know the answer. Nevertheless, the privileged have dared to preclude the third estate. No matter how useful you are, they have said, no matter how able you are, you can go so far and no further. Honors are not for the likes of you. The rare exceptions, noticeable as they are bound to be, are mere mockery, and the sort of language allowed on such occasions is an additional insult. If this exclusion is a social crime, a veritable act of war against the third estate, can it be said at least to be useful to the commonwealth? Ah, do we not understand the consequences of monopoly? While discouraging those it excludes, does it not destroy the skill of those it favors? Are we unaware that any work from which free competition is excluded will be performed less well and more expensively? It suffices to have made the point that the so-called usefulness of a privileged order to the public service is a fallacy, that, without help from this order, all the arduous tasks in the service are performed by the third estate, that without this order the higher posts could be infinitely better filled, that they ought to be the natural prize and reward of recognized ability and service, and that if the privileged have succeeded in usurping all well-paid and honorific posts, this is both a hateful iniquity towards the generality of citizens and an act of treason to the commonwealth. Who is bold enough to maintain that the third estate does not contain within itself everything needful to constitute a complete nation? It is like a strong and robust man with one arm still in chains. If the privileged order were removed, the nation would not be something less but something more. What then is the third estate? All, but an all that is fettered and oppressed. What would it be without the privileged order? It would be all, but free and flourishing. Nothing will go well without the third estate. Everything would go considerably better without the two others. It is not enough to have shown that the privileged, far from being useful to the nation, can only weaken and injure it. We must prove further that the nobility is not part of our society at all. It may be a burden for the nation, but it cannot be part of it. First, it is impossible to find what place to assign to the cast of nobles among all the elements of a nation. I know that there are many people, all too many, who from infirmity, incapacity, incurable idleness, or a collapse of morality, perform no functions at all in society. Exceptions and abuses always exist alongside the rule, and particularly in a large commonwealth. But all will agree that the fewer these abuses, the better organized a state is supposed to be. The most ill-organized state of all would be the one where not just isolated individuals, but a complete class of citizens would glory in inactivity amidst the general movement and contrive to consume the best part of the product without having in any way helped to produce it. Such a class, 
surely is foreign to the nation because of its idleness. The nobility, however, is also a foreigner in our midst because of its civil and political prerogatives. What is a nation? A body of associates living under common laws and represented by the same legislative assembly, etc. Is it not obvious that the nobility possesses privileges and exemptions which it brazenly calls its rights, and which stand distinct from the rights of the great body of citizens? Because of these special rights, the nobility does not belong to the common order, nor is it subjected to the common laws. Thus, its private rights make it a people apart in the great nation. It is truly imperium in imperio. As for its political rights, it also exercises these separately from the nation. It has its own representatives who are charged with no mandate from the people. Its deputies sit separately, and even if they sat in the same chamber as the deputies of ordinary citizens, they would still constitute a different and separate representation. They are foreign to the nation first because of their origin, since they do not owe their powers to the people, and secondly because of their aim, since this consists in defending not the general interest but the private one. The third estate then contains everything that pertains to the nation, while nobody outside the third estate can be considered as part of the nation. What is the third estate? Everything. End quote. When the Abbe C.A. first publishes what is the third estate in early 1789, it sounds radical if not outright seditious. By the end of the French Revolution, C.A.'s version of nationhood is all but taken for granted. The delegates to the Estates General meet in Paris on May 4, 1789, to attend a ceremonial mass. More than a religious ceremony, this is an opportunity for all of the delegates to parade before the people of Paris. It's meant to be a display of national unity. But anyone watching the procession can tell that something is off. While the nobles parade in their finest clothes and the clergy wear their ceremonial vestments, the delegates for the third estate are dressed all in black, a visual display of their inferior status under the Ancien Regime. The response from the crowd lining the street is unmistakable. As the third estate delegates pass, there's wild cheering, but the crowd goes silent as the nobles and clergy pass, only to once again erupt into cheers as Louis XVI and his liberal cousin Louis-Philippe II, the Duke of Orléans, pass, and then they fall silent again as Marie Antoinette brings up the rear. On the next morning, May 5th, 1789, the Estates General meet for real, this time in the Hall of Minor Diversions, an enormous sports complex outside of Paris, located about a quarter mile from the Palace of Versailles. Louis XVI keeps his opening remarks short and sweet, asking for an increase in taxes to pay down debt incurred in what he calls a costly but honorable war while expressing distress over what he calls an exaggerated desire for innovation, a thinly veiled jab at the idea of combining the estates to vote by head, or even, horror of horrors, putting constitutional limits on the king's power. This is followed by another short speech, delivered by Charles-Louis de Barentin, the Keeper of the Seals. Barentin is not a strong speaker, and he talks in such a soft voice that hardly anyone can hear what is said. Next, Jacques Necker takes the podium to discuss the kingdom's finances. Given his popularity with the people, as well as his position as finance minister, Necker seems like a logical choice to address what is supposed to be the reason for the estate's meeting in the first place fixing France's financial crisis. Unfortunately for just about everybody, Necker drops the ball. He runs off a dry list of facts and figures that leaves many of the delegates cross-eyed. 
Nicare's wheelhouse is finance, not public speaking, and his voice gives out after half an hour. So he hands over the rest of his speech to a subordinate who then speaks for another two and a half hours. After this, the estates adjourn to the following day, leaving many of the delegates disappointed. Remember, the Cahier de Plainte et Doléances had included a slew of proposals for reform, and so far the complaints of the various estates have not even been mentioned. Instead, the delegates have been subjected to a rebuke by their king, followed by possibly the most boring three-hour speech in French history. The next day, May 6th, the three estates break out into separate rooms for what is supposed to be a formality. Each estate is simply supposed to certify the election of its own delegates before getting down to the business of new taxes. Little do they know that this will be the last thing the estates general ever does. When they go to their own chambers, the first and second estates meet in finely appointed rooms with tapestries and other expensive decor. The third estate is given a more plain room and yet another slap in the face to the common people. Furthermore, the first and second estates meet in closed sessions, while the meeting of the third estate is open to the public. Unlike the choice of rooms, this is an intentional choice by the third estate. Many far-sighted delegates recognize that as much as arguing their cases to their fellow delegates, they are appealing directly to the French public. While the first and second estate delegations move quickly to certify their members, the third estate refuses to do any such thing. Leaders like Mirabeau argue convincingly that the third estate taking action on its own, even to certify its own members, will legitimize the idea that the three estates are separate bodies and should therefore each receive one vote. For delegates who have argued from the beginning for all of the estates to vote as one body, this would be unacceptable. So, instead of certifying anybody, the third estate does nothing while continuing to meet day after day for five weeks. Finally, on June 10th, the third estate leadership decides to send unofficial delegations to the representatives of the first and second estates, inviting them to meet together as one legislative body. The second estate mindful of its noble privileges, refuses outright. But the first estate becomes deadlocked on the issue. While the bishops are keen to maintain their grip on power, the first estate delegation is actually dominated by parish priests, who have no special privileges to protect and who have more in common with everyday French people than they do with their superiors in the church hierarchy. In order to pressure both the first and second estates, the third estate also issues an ultimatum. If the other estates do not agree to meet as one body, the third will proceed to govern without them. Two days later, on June 12th, the dam begins to break. When the estates convene for business, three priests from the first estate join the third estate in their chamber instead. Six more join on June 14th and ten more on June 16th. Meanwhile, on June 15th, the Abbe C.A. proposes that the third estate makes good on its threat to govern alone, along with anyone from the other estates who chooses to join them. He suggests that this new legislative body be called the Assembly of the Recognized and Verified Representatives of the French Nation. Mirabeau objects that this name is too long, and the delegates spend the next two days fielding various suggestions until C.A. proposes a new name on June 17th, the National Assembly. 
the motion is carried, and from this moment, the third estate ceases to function, while the others become irrelevant. The same day, in an even more radical move, the new National Assembly declares that it, and it alone, has the authority to levy taxes, and says that all existing taxes are only approved on a provisional basis until the Assembly chooses to approve or revoke them. This marks the first of many moments that some historians consider the true beginning of the French Revolution. On June 19th, the first estate finally folds. By a vote of 149 to 137, they narrowly decide to join the National Assembly. Predictably, almost all of the votes in favor are lower-ranking clergy, while the bishops almost universally vote no. Either way, two of the three estates are now part of the National Assembly, where they will vote by head and not by estate. Only the nobles continue to hold out. The man who's supposed to be in charge of the French state, Louis XVI, is somewhat distracted at the moment. His seven-year-old son, Louis-Joseph, the heir to the throne, had died of tuberculosis on June 4th. At times being what they are, losing a child is fairly common, but it seems to hit King Louis particularly hard, and he's not really paying attention to what's going on just down the road from his royal palace. Instead, spending most of his time hunting during this crucial period. Some liberal ministers, including Necker, urge a policy of conciliation towards the National Assembly. Necker even draws up a plan to revoke all noble tax privileges, approve voting by head, and open all positions in the civil service and the military to people of all classes, with promotions based on merit. A conservative faction, including two of Louis's brothers and Marie Antoinette, encourage him instead to take the opposite course, declare the National Assembly illegal, and order all three estates to meet in their separate chambers and vote by order. On this occasion, Louis takes the advice of the conservative faction and calls a special séance royale, or royal session, for June 23rd. Once again, the royal government manages to royally mishandle the situation. See, the royal session is set to convene in the Salle de Menu Plaisir, the largest room available and the one in which the National Assembly happens to be meeting. However, the room needs to be prepared. Remember, it was very plain for the third estate delegates to meet there, and the royal ministry wants to spruce it up for the king's session. So they order the room temporarily closed to keep out any delegates and allow the workmen to do their jobs. But nobody at the royal ministry actually bothers to announce that a royal session is happening, nor that the Salle de Menu Plaisir needs to be closed for minor renovations. So when the National Assembly delegates arrive on the morning of June 20th, they find themselves locked out, with armed guards outside who can only tell them that the room is closed. The most charitable historical interpretation is that this is all just a big misunderstanding. The less charitable interpretation is that the king intends to shut down the National Assembly by force. Understandably, the delegates take the latter interpretation. But rather than just to go back to their hotels, they search for the nearest available space to meet, and they decide on an indoor tennis court just up the street from the Salle de Menu Plaisir. Incidentally, this location is suggested by a physician named Joseph Ignace Guillotine, who will soon become infamous for the device that bears his name. Once convened, the members of the National Assembly swear what comes to be known as the Tennis Court Oath, which reads as follows. 
Quote, The National Assembly, considering that it has been summoned to establish the constitution of the kingdom, to effect the regeneration of public order, and to maintain the true principles of monarchy, that nothing can prevent it from continuing its deliberations in whatever place it may be forced to establish itself, and, finally, that wheresoever its members are assembled, there is the National Assembly, decrees that all members of this assembly shall take a solemn oath not to separate and to reassemble wherever circumstances may require, until the condition of the kingdom is established and consolidated upon firm foundations." and that, the said oath taken, all members and each one of them individually shall ratify this steadfast resolution by signature. End quote. 557 delegates sign the tennis court oath, as do 20 alternates. Over the next couple of days, 60 more delegates will sign, bringing the total number of signatories to 637. Now, I want to stress that these people, at least most of them, are hardly radical revolutionaries. The oath talks about the true principles of monarchy, which refers to a constitutional monarchy with defined limits that circumscribe the king's power. The delegates take June 21st off because it's a Sunday, and the next day, the 22nd, they find themselves evicted from the tennis court. They keep their oath to continue meeting, though, and convene in the Church of Notre Dame de Saint-Louis, where they are joined by 150 more members of the clergy and even a pair of enlightened nobles, who are the first two members of the second estate to break ranks and officially join the National Assembly. On June 23rd, they dutifully return to the Salle de Menu Plaisir to attend the royal session. Again, notice that despite all of the efforts to dissolve the assembly and maintain the feudal privileges of the nobility, the delegates are still paying deference to the king. At this time, nobody is seriously talking about overthrowing the monarchy. They're just asking for reform. Louis XVI's June 23rd speech is a bit of a mixed bag. He does confirm some of the reforms that Necker has suggested, such as the abolishment of the corvée, internal excise tax tolls, and letters de cachet, which, if you remember, are those letters that the king can use to arrest anyone he wants for any reason. Louis also upholds the principles of religious toleration and freedom of the press. However, he also declares that the National Assembly is illegal and orders them to disperse and return to their respective estates and meet separately. In other words, the idea of voting by head is going to be thrown out the window, and the first and second estates will once again have the ability to uphold their privileges by outvoting the third estate by two to one in the estates general. To be fair, King Louis says he's willing to accept universal taxation and the abolishment of other special privileges maintained by the nobility and the church. He's even technically open to allowing voting by head, but only on the condition that any reforms are agreed to by the first and second estates. In other words, too bad, so sad, there's not going to be any such reform because we all know the first and second estates will not agree to those reforms. Louis closes his address as follows. Quote, If you abandon me in this great enterprise, I will work alone for the welfare of my people. I will consider myself alone their true representatives. None of your plans or proceedings can become law without my express approval. I command you to separate at once and to proceed tomorrow morning each to the hall of his own order to renew your deliberations. End quote. With that, Louis XVI and his retinue leave the room, along with most of the nobles and the high ranking clergy. But 
the members of the National Assembly remain in their seats. After a few minutes, the master of ceremonies goes to Jean-Sylvain Bailly, the president of the National Assembly, and asks whether or not he heard the king's order to disperse. Bailly replies, quote, It seems to me that the nation assembled cannot take orders. End quote. If that's not clear enough, Mirabeau ups the ante. As is often the case, his exact words are lost to us. It's not as if there's somebody writing down everything that's said at this point. But my favorite version is reported two days later in a newspaper called Le Moniteur. According to this account, Mirabeau says to the MC, quote, We have heard the wishes which have been suggested by the king, and you, sir, who have no right to be his spokesman to the etat general, you who have no place and no voice here, and no right to speak, you are not made to remind us of his words. Go and tell those who have sent you that we are here by the will of the people, and can only be made to leave by the force of bayonets. End quote. In his book, The French Revolution from Enlightenment to Tyranny, British historian Ian Davidson writes, quote, The commoners were challenging the legitimacy of royal authority by claiming to represent the French nation. Not all Frenchmen would have been primarily conscious of being French. In practice, most French people of the time would have tended to identify more closely with their home province or smaller locality. But here, Bailly and Mirabeau were claiming to speak in the name of the whole of France. The king's authority had been openly defied, and he did not respond to the challenge. The next day, June 24th, the majority of the clergy joined the Third Estate, and the day after, 47 nobles followed them, including the Duc d'Orléans. Two days later, the king simply gave way and invited his faithful clergy and his faithful noblesse to join the Third Estate. On this first and most fundamental point of principle, the Third Estate had won, not by firing guns, not with bloodthirsty crowds, but with ordinary commoners, sitting in their places, silently and refusing to be intimidated. Just sitting there, saying what they wanted, and then going on sitting there. In short, the French Revolution happened not because a huge crowd of Parisians stormed the Bastille, nor because gangs of marauding peasants periodically set fire to noblemen's chateau in the countryside, which they did, but because the king surrendered to the Third Estate. When the crisis came, the absolute monarchy of Louis XVI simply fell over like a dead tree. As Fure says, the Ancien Regime was dead before it was knocked over. End quote. On June 25th, the same day the king's cousin, the Duc d'Orléans, joins the National Assembly, the Paris delegates for the Third Estate take the unprecedented move of dissolving the Paris City Council and appointing a new city council of their own. On its face, this sounds like another big revolutionary move, but in fact, it's relatively non-controversial at the time, and the old city council willingly hands over its responsibilities. Why? Simply put, the old city council has proved incapable of maintaining order. Crowds of Parisians, estimated at around 10,000 in number, have been milling around outside the palace at Versailles. These crowds aren't particularly violent, but they're loud and unruly, and the threat of violence is in the air. Now, there are government troops in the area who are more than capable of resisting the mob, but these troops are volunteers, drawn almost exclusively from the common people, and rather than try to keep order, many have been seen standing around chatting with people in the crowd, and some have even declared openly that they will act only on the National Assembly's orders. By accepting a city council that's loyal to the Assembly, 
The city elders are hoping to keep these troops obedient and maintain some kind of order. This turns out to be only partially effective. When ten mutinous soldiers are imprisoned for disobeying orders, a 4,000-strong mob of Parisians storms the prison and breaks them out. The National Assembly, like the king, is quickly losing control of the situation. Six days later, on July 1st, Louis XVI decides to call more loyal troops into the capital region, both to Versailles and to Paris itself in order to maintain his own authority. In the abstract, this doesn't sound like a terrible idea, but the devil is in the details. The French people might be willing to accept a large contingent of French troops in the capital, but the king is still distracted, and the people urging him to move in troops in the first place are the conservative faction, led by Marie Antoinette and the king's brothers, the Comte de Provence and the Comte d'Artois. Instead of Frenchmen, the troops are a mix of Swiss and German mercenaries from the eastern frontier. Over the course of the next several days, 6,000 of these troops are moved into Versailles, and an additional 10,000 are moved into Paris itself. Many people, including many delegates to the National Assembly, see this as a prelude to a royal coup against the new popular government, and some delegates even take to sleeping in the Assembly's chamber rather than exposing themselves to arrest by going outside. One common misconception about authoritarian governments is that they can do whatever they want without repercussions. This misconception is widespread in more open societies, which leads people in, for example, modern Western democracies to grossly misread events in non-democratic regimes. To borrow an example from modern times, communist China is one of the world's most repressive countries, with surveillance capabilities that the French Bourbon monarchs could only have dreamed of. But when widespread street protests broke out against the country's zero-COVID policies in late 2022, Xi Jinping's government was forced to back down and loosen many of their restrictions. This is the power of public opinion, and leaders ignore it at their peril. In France, in July of 1789, Marie Antoinette and the rest of the conservative faction seemed to be drinking their own Kool-Aid. In Marie Antoinette's defense, it's worth remembering that just as Louis has recently lost a son, well, so has she. But while Louis seems to channel his grief into non-stop hunting, Marie Antoinette has channels hers into anger against the liberals and the National Assembly. The conservatives compound their error on July 11th by finally convincing King Louis to fire the popular and liberal Jacques Necker. In his book, Citizens, a chronicle of the French Revolution, British historian Simon Shama writes, quote, The minister was about to begin a congenial dinner at the proper hour of three in the afternoon, when the minister of the navy, La Luzerne, arrived with a letter from the king. It was terse and to the point. It required Necker to remove himself sans bruit, in secret, from Versailles, indeed from France altogether, and return to Switzerland. Necker pocketed the note, spoke briefly to his wife, and called for the carriage in which he usually took his evening drive. Around five o'clock, a valise was slung into its interior. Madame Necker, still in her tenue de soirée, got in, followed by her husband. The coach should by rights have turned south towards the Mâconnais, Lyon, and the Swiss frontier. Instead, it traveled northeast towards Brussels, where the Nickers alighted the following day. From there, he wrote a letter to the Dutch banker's hope, ensuring them that, notwithstanding his dismissal, the two million livres they had loaned as security for impending grain shipments to France remained good. 
It was an act of an honnête homme. In dramatic contrast with the petulant insecurity of the monarch who had sacked him. End quote. Despite his following the king's orders to keep his firing secret, Necker's sacking almost immediately becomes public knowledge. And it doesn't just upset the lower classes, which would be predictable enough. It also creates a financial panic amongst the upper classes, especially wealthy merchants who have invested in loans to the French state. After all, it stands to reason that the king wouldn't fire his popular finance minister for no reason. If Necker is on the outs, then the government finances must be even worse than everyone thought. As soon as the next day, July 12, 1789, angry citizens are standing on street corners, demanding transparency from the royal ministry. The financial panic quickly trickles down from the upper classes to the lower classes. For the wealthy, a French default could mean financial ruin. But for the Paris poor, who spend between 50 and 80 percent of their income on food, even a mild financial crisis could mean starvation. By giving in to the demands of his wife and conservative ministers, Louis has shaken his people's faith in the monarchy. And with panic amongst all of the country's classes, it has become nigh impossible to play one part of the population against another. In only two more days, the public discontent will boil over into the French Revolution's most famous flashpoint, the storming of the Bastille. This is a real shame, since... At the same time all of this is going on, the National Assembly is hard at work crafting a written constitution. Had the conservative faction in the royal ministry not overplayed its hand, France may well have made a bloodless transition to a constitutional monarchy. On July 9th, the National Assembly renames itself the National Constituent Assembly to reflect this constitutional objective. Most people simply call it the Constituent Assembly, so when I say Constituent Assembly, just remember that it's a continuation of the National Assembly we've already been talking about. Mirabeau, who for now is the Assembly's de facto leader, calls for, quote, a government more or less like England's, end quote and he's troubled by the increasing chaos in and around Paris. In a July 8th speech, he prophetically says, quote, Have these men studied, in the history of any people, how revolutions commence and how they are carried out? Have they observed by what a fatal chain of circumstances the wisest men are driven far beyond the limits of moderation? and by what terrible impulses an enraged people is precipitated into excesses at the very thought of which they would have shuddered. End quote. Meanwhile, the Marquis de Lafayette, who is intimately familiar with the American Revolution and the American form of government, is trying to hammer out a French equivalent to the Bill of Rights. This document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, will go on to become one of the world's most important political works. We'll talk about it in the next episode, but for now it has yet to be written. All of this to say that while the Constituent Assembly means well and may well have been capable of overseeing a smooth transition to constitutional monarchy, it's unable to keep up with events on the ground in Paris. When I say Paris, I mean Paris, not France at large. Keep in mind that most of the country is rural, and that the bulk of the population is considerably more conservative than the average Parisian. Parisian cultural imperialists, meaning most of the people in the city, like to think of themselves as representing the entire country. As the revolution grows more and more radical, they will learn just how wrong they are, but for now, Paris is the heart of the revolution, 
and things on the ground are getting out of any one person's control. On July 12th, the day everyone is protesting against Nicare's dismissal, a particularly rowdy group of Parisians have gathered outside a cafe near the Palais Royal, which is the old royal palace, built by Cardinal Richelieu and located in the heart of Paris. This crowd isn't just upset about the sacking of their favorite royal minister. Remember, there's also a widespread and probably accurate belief that the royal government's next move will be to use those foreign mercenaries to break up the constituent assembly itself. On the sidewalk in front of the cafe, a 29-year-old lawyer named Camille de Moulin stands up on a table and delivers a speech praising the constituent assembly and castigating King Louis for trying to break it up. De Moulin is one of the revolution's lesser-known figures, but he's a former classmate of Robespierre, who, as I said, will be a huge figure later on. He's also the business partner of Georges Danton, another of the revolution's giants. Ironically, de Moulin and Danton are partners because de Moulin is a poor speaker and Danton is a poor writer. But on this day, de Moulin's speech ignites a fire in the crowd. As he's about to finish his speech, as if on cue, a band of German cavalry is seen approaching from a distance to break up the crowd. De Moulin pulls out a pistol, points it at his own chest, and says something along the lines of, I would rather die than submit to servitude. Ironically, De Moulin will die not at the hands of the king's soldiers, but as one of the many victims of the revolution's reign of terror, which is still a ways down the road. In response to De Moulin's speech, the crowd of angry Parisians turns into a mob. Now, July 12th is a Sunday, and Paris in the 18th century is as much of a cultural hub as it is in the 21st century. So on this particular afternoon, the theaters are packed with people enjoying their day off, soaking in some of that culture. The mob marches through the city, closing one theater after another and urging the patrons to join them. Many people do, and the mob grows. In the early evening, the crowds have grown large enough that the royal troops consider them a real threat. The German cavalry I mentioned earlier launches a charge and disperses them by force, at which point a group of native French infantry arrives to reinforce those cavalry. But instead, the French soldiers side with their fellow citizens and point their guns at the cavalry who wisely withdraw. Elsewhere in the city, another regiment of German cavalry disperses another mob, but the residential commander, a Frenchman, does not want to actually hurt any Parisians, so after initially dispersing the crowd, he orders his men to withdraw, at which point the mob simply reforms. On July 13, 1789, after a restless night, the crowds continue to riot. One of the first things they do is to ransack the city's weapon shops, seizing not just any musket they can find, but also swords. Those who are unable to find a purpose-built weapon arm themselves with improvised ones. Some carry clubs, and many people simply grab a kitchen knife from their own house. The crowds also destroy the customs barriers which are positioned on the roads in and out of Paris to collect the hated excise taxes. At the same time, they build barricades of their own at strategic locations to stymie the movement of troops who are loyal to the king. In one particularly noteworthy incident, the mob raids the monastery of St. Lazare. They find no weapons there, but they do find a large cache of grain that's been set aside as part of Nicare's plan to distribute free food to the poor. But in life, 
What people believe to be true is often more important than what is true. And while much of the anger against the king's regime is rooted in legitimate grievances, there are also a number of conspiracy theories floating around. One of the leading theories is that the king and the nobility are intentionally withholding food in order to starve the population. How the regime would benefit from deliberately starving its own people isn't clear to me, but the mere existence of this hidden grain is enough to rile up the crowd to new heights of outrage. In the face of this even angrier mob, the royal troops withdraw from Paris entirely. The city is now in the grip of mob rule, and a crowd of people forms outside the Hotel de Ville, the Paris City Hall, to demand weapons. In response to the widespread protests and disorder, the Constituent Assembly creates a new Paris militia, made up primarily of members of the bourgeoisie. Within hours, there are 48,000 volunteers, and the Assembly plans to arm them with 12,000 muskets. With no time to get these guys proper uniforms, the members of the new militia are instead instructed to wear cockades, which are round ribbons that can be pinned to a hat or shirt. As befits a Parisian militia, the cockades are red and blue, which are the colors of Paris. Eventually, the white color of the Bourbon dynasty will be added to the cockades, which is where we get the French red, white, and blue tricolor. But while the militia is made up of middle-class volunteers, many people joining the French Revolution come from the sans-culottes, which are the working classes. Culottes are the silk knee breeches that are worn by the upper classes while working men wear ordinary long pants. This working class mob is far more radical than any militia of lawyers or merchants, and with bread prices soaring and hungry mouths to feed, it's easy to understand why. I'll mention here that the Marquis de Lafayette will be elected as commander-in-chief of the new Paris National Guard on July 14th, but his appointment will come too late to stop any of what's about to happen. July 14, 1789, is one of the most famous, or depending on your point of view, infamous days in history. It's the day of the storming of the Bastille, which is another event that many people consider the true beginning of the French Revolution. Early in the day, a mix of militiamen and ordinary citizens raids Les Invalides, a retirement home for old soldiers. It also does double duty as an armory, which explains why the Parisians are so eager to get inside. There, they seize somewhere around 30,000 muskets, as well as a dozen cannons. The commander of Les Invalides had foreseen such an attack, and with no real way to defend his arsenal, he had ordered the hammers removed from the muskets in order to disable them but the retired soldiers have more sympathy for the crowds than for the regime. So only a handful of muskets are actually disabled. And by a handful, I mean something on the order of a dozen guns out of the 30,000. One thing the mob can't find is gunpowder. As a further security measure, the commander had ordered all 250 barrels of gunpowder in his arsenal to be transferred to the Bastille, which, by the way, is actually pronounced Bastille, but for once I'll make a concession to my English-speaking audience and use the pronunciation everybody already knows. The Bastille is a medieval fortress located on the east end of Paris. Originally built to defend against the English during the Hundred Years' War, it has since been converted to a prison. During the reign of Cardinal Richelieu, I mean Louis XIII, it gained a fearsome reputation as a dank dungeon that housed political prisoners. During the reign of Louis XVI, it's barely even a prison anymore. 
On July 14, 1789, it houses a whopping seven prisoners. Four of these are forgers. One is a man who had tried to assassinate the previous king, Louis XV. Another is a mentally ill Scotsman who's been causing trouble in the city. And the last is a young aristocrat imprisoned at the request of his father for suspected murder. The most famous prisoner of the revolutionary era, the Marquis de Sade, had been removed ten days earlier after repeatedly trying to stir up a mob by shouting out the window that people were being tortured. The royal government is even considering closing the Bastille because it's expensive to maintain and who needs a medieval fortress in 1789 anyway? Much of the Bastille's grim reputation is due to memoirs by earlier prisoners, and it is exaggerated to say the least. It's not unusual for political prisoners to get locked up, and noble families sometimes pay the king to issue letters de cachet to imprison children who are embarrassing them in one way or another. The Bastille is also famous for housing high-profile individuals like the Cardinal de Rohan and Jean de Valois, who had been held there while awaiting trial in the affair of the diamond necklace. Prisoners are allowed to have guests, bring in personal belongings like books and clothes, pay for whatever kind of food they like, and even to keep pets. Normally, these are cats or dogs, although the Marquis de Sade had brought his pet duck. Some recent prisoners had even paid to have a billiards table installed so they could play pool. As 18th century prisons go, the Bastille is less a place of terrible suffering and more like one of those nice luxury prisons they send white-collar criminals to. But if you're trying to write a memoir about your imprisonment, nobody wants to hear about how you spent the whole time reading, playing pool, and petting your cat. You're not going to sell many copies that way. So contemporary memoirs are full of exaggerated descriptions of torture devices and foreboding dungeons with hundreds of prisoners chained to the walls of dark, dank cells. Finally, a word on the construction of the building itself. If you look at artwork depicting the storming of the Bastille, it's often depicted as an enormous fortress. This befits the Bastille's outsized significance and symbolic importance to the revolution, but it is an exaggeration. In fact, the building consists of eight towers of varying heights, the tallest of which is about 70 feet tall, and all of which have eight to five foot thick walls. So it's big, but it's not built on an epic scale. There's also a courtyard with a moat across it, but while the outer wall has a drawbridge, there's no exterior moat. And in fact, there are neighboring buildings constructed right up against the outer walls. This is, in fact, one of the Bastille's weaknesses. Remember, it was built to defend Paris from an external attack. The people who built it back in the 1300s didn't expect it to be attacked from inside the city. A fortress is only as good as its defenders, and while the walls are dotted with cannons that could fight off a formidable attack, the troops inside are less impressive. There are 32 Swiss guards who are crack fighters and have recently been transferred over at the commander's request, but again, there are only 32 of them. The other 82 defenders are what the French call invalides, meaning war invalids, uh, older men who are spending a few years of semi-retirement in what is supposed to be an easy, low-stress job guarding a handful of prisoners and performing maintenance work. These are not the guys you call when there's serious fighting to do. Moreover, the Bastille is not prepared to withstand a siege. 
Why would it be? It's a prison in the national capital during peacetime. The defenders have only two days' supply of food and no source of fresh water. The commander himself is 49-year-old Bernard René de Launay. The son of a previous governor of the Bastille, de Launay has spent almost all of his life in and around Paris. He's served in a guard regiment that never leaves the capital and has now been in charge of the Bastille for 13 years. During that time, he has developed a reputation for competency, if also for lenience both as a commander and a jailer. He's also, seriously, afraid of the dark. Whenever there's a loud noise in the night, Delaunay wakes up yelling that the fort is under attack. This might be understandable if he had served in the field and suffered from what we now call PTSD, but the guy has never been under enemy fire and his fear of the dark is the source of some jokes among his men. This is the man now tasked with defending the Bastille from an angry mob. As I said, the crowd goes to the Bastille because they want gunpowder. After arriving outside, two members of the new city council appoint themselves as negotiators, and Bernard René de Launay allows them inside to negotiate. They spend two hours inside, which is long enough that the crowd starts to grow suspicious. Have their representatives been arrested? Is de Launay buying time so royal forces from outside Paris can regroup and attack the crowd? With nothing but silence from inside the Bastille, it's easy to imagine the worst. A third member of the city council then asks to go inside with explicit instructions to come out as quickly as possible. Inside, he finds the other two council members enjoying a leisurely lunch with de Launay. As it turns out, the commander has agreed to one of the crowd's demands. The cannons on the ramparts, which would have been capable of firing at crowds inside of Paris, are already in the process of being removed. But as for their demand for gunpowder, de Launay insists that he can't turn it over without explicit permission from his superiors at Versailles. The three council members then leave the Bastille and head back to the Hotel de Ville to talk to the rest of the city council and decide on their next move. They arrive there at one o'clock in the afternoon, and after debating for half an hour, decide that to avoid bloodshed, they'll accept the removal of the cannons as sufficient capitulation. They even collect a bugle to call the crowd to attention and announce that the guns have been removed. They'll figure out how to get a hold of some gunpowder another way. But as they're getting ready to head back, the sound of gunfire erupts from the direction of the Bastille. Returning to Simon Shama's account, quote, A group, including an ex-soldier, now carriage maker, had climbed onto the roof of a perfume shop abutting the gate to the inner courtyard and, failing to find the keys to the courtyard, had cut the drawbridge chains. They had crashed down without warning, killing one of the crowd who stood beneath, and over the bridge and his body poured hundreds of the besiegers. At this point, the defending soldiers shouted to the people to withdraw or else they would fire, and this too was misinterpreted as encouragement to come further. The first shots were fired. Subsequently, each side would claim the other fired first, but since no one among the melee knew that their own people had cut the drawbridge, it was assumed that they had been let into the inner courtyard in order to be mowed down in the confined space by the cannon. It was of a piece with all the other assumptions of treachery and conspiracy, of the cordial greeting behind which was the plan of death and destruction, Artois and those responsible for Necker's removal. The queen, who appeared tender-hearted yet plotted revenge, were all among this cast of villains as far as the people were concerned. 
and now De Launay, the governor who let down the drawbridge to take better aim, joined their number. It was the fury unleashed by this deceit that made it impossible for subsequent delegations from the electors, of which there were many, to get past the fighting and organize some kind of ceasefire. The battle became serious. At about half past three in the afternoon, the crowd was reinforced by companies of Garde Francais and by defecting soldiers, including a number who were veterans of the American campaign. Two in particular, 2nd Lieutenant Jacob Ely, the standard bearer of the infantry of the Queen, and Pierre-Augustin Houlan, the director of the Queen's Laundry, were crucial in turning the incoherent assault into an organized siege. Houlan and Ely also brought an ample supply of arms taken from the Invalide that morning. With them were two cannon, one bronze and the other the Siamese gun inlaid with silver that had been seized from the royal storehouse the day before. It was Louis XIV's toy then that would end the old regime in Paris. It was decided to aim the guns directly at the gate, since balls seemed to bounce harmlessly off the eight-foot-thick walls. Before that could be done, carts filled with burning dung and straw, which had been lit by Santerre to provide smoke cover for the movements of the besiegers, had to be removed from the approach to the gate. At some risk to himself, Ali did this in company with a haberdasher familiarly known as Vive l'Amour. The heavy guns were drawn back on gun carriages, charged and aimed. A wooden gate now divided the cannon of the besiegers from those of the defenders, perhaps a hundred feet apart. Had they opened up at each other, dreadful carnage would have been guaranteed. But if the attackers could not see the defending guns, the defending troops were well aware of the peril they stood in. Faced with the increasing reluctance of the Invalide to prolong the fighting, Delaunay was himself demoralized. In any case, there was no food with which to withstand a prolonged siege, so that his main concern now was for a surrender that would preserve the honor and the lives of the garrison. He had one card the powder. In his darkest moments, he simply thought of exploding the entire store rather than capitulating. Dissuaded from this act of desperation, he resolved to use the threat at least to secure an honorable evacuation. With no white flag available, a handkerchief was flown from one of the towers and the Bastille's guns stopped firing. At around five, a note asking for such a capitulation, written by the governor, and threatening the explosion unless it was given, was stuck through a chink through the drawbridge wall of the inner courtyard. A plank was laid down over the moat with men standing on one end to steady it. The first person on the plank fell into the moat, but the second, whose identity thereafter was hotly disputed, retrieved it. The demand, however, was refused, and in response to the continued anger of the crowd, Hulan was apparently preparing to fire the Siamese cannon when the drawbridge suddenly came down. The Vancouver, conquerors, rushed into the prison, liberated all seven of the prisoners, took possession of the gunpowder, and disarmed the defending troops. The Swiss guards, who had prudently taken off their uniform coats, were initially mistaken for prisoners and unharmed. But some of the Invalides were brutally dealt with. A soldier named Bicard, who had been one of those responsible for dissuading De Launay from detonating the gunpowder, had his hand severed almost as soon as he opened one of the gates of the fort. Under the impression that he was one of the prison warders, the crowd paraded the hand about the streets, still gripping a key. Later that evening, he was misidentified again, this time as one of the cannoneers who had first fired on the people, and was hanged in the place de grave, along with one of his comrades, before the thirty Swiss guards lined up as an obligatory audience. 
the battle itself had taken the lives of 83 of the citizens' army. Another 15 were to die from wounds. Only one of the Invalides had died in the fighting, and three had been wounded. The imbalance was enough for the crowd to demand some sort of punitive sacrifice. End quote. Perhaps if Delaunay had shown more resilience, he could have driven away the crowd. I'm thinking, for example, of a certain Corsican artillery commander who will fire what he calls a whiff of grape shot at our Paris mob much later in our story. But the French Revolution has yet to reach the point where everybody is out for blood, and Delaunay has shown moderation in the face of mob violence. It will, quite literally, be the death of him. Along with several of his troops, Delaunay is paraded through the streets of Paris back to the Hotel de Ville. Along the way, they're mocked, spit on, and beaten by the angry mob, which is preparing to lynch them right there in the street. Some more level-headed members of the crowd, including Hulan and Ali, convince everyone to calm down and at least give the Bastille's defenders a proper trial. But after everything he's been through, Delaunay is in no mood to sit through what is all too likely to be a kangaroo court. Instead, he shouts, Enough! Let me die! And with those words, he turns to one of the guys who had hauled him through the streets and kicks him hard right between the legs. Almost immediately, several people shoot him all at once, after which other members of the crowd stab his body just for good measure. Somebody tries to hack off his head with a saber. But if you've ever butchered an animal, you'll know that cutting off a head isn't as easy as the movies make it look. In fact, the crowd turns to a butcher, a man named Matthew Jove Jordan, to finish the job with a carving knife. Delaunay's head is then stuck on a pike and paraded through Paris, along with all seven of the prisoners released from the Bastille. In addition to the two men Simon Shama mentioned, three more defenders of the Bastille are also hanged in the streets, and their bodies are paraded around as well. The rest of the Swiss guards and Invalides are quietly handed off to French soldiers who escort them to safety outside the city limits. The mood in Paris is ecstatic with thousands of citizens joining the impromptu parade, shooting guns in the air and generally having a celebration. The royal troops have been driven out, the militia is now well armed, and the odds of a royal coup against the constituent assembly seem to have gone way down. But to anyone of a more philosophical bent, what has happened on July the 14th is a tad disturbing. Yes, Paris and the Constituent Assembly are safe, for the moment, but at what cost? The rioting, though deplorable, can be justified. The raiding of the weapons shops, of Les Invalides, and even the storming of the Bastille may have been necessary. But the extrajudicial killing of Delaunay and the other lynched soldiers is inexcusable. After all, they had surrendered in good faith. Those acts aren't part of any government reform, nor are they necessary in any sense of the word. They're just mob justice, meted out to the most convenient targets for the crowd's anger. So to anyone who's thinking ahead... July 14, 1789 is a somber night, and you have to wonder what's coming next. In light of this, many accounts of the storming of the Bastille make note of Louis XVI's diary entry for the day of July 14, which consists of two words, nothing today. Those words are often used to imply that the king is indifferent to the day's events, 
But Louis isn't talking about the Bastille. Remember, he's spending most of his time hunting, and nothing today means simply that he hasn't harvested any game. In fact, news of the fall of the Bastille doesn't even reach Versailles until July 15th, the next morning. Nobody knows how Louis XVI really reacts when he gets the news, but there's a popular myth that perfectly illustrates how quickly things have changed. According to the story, one of his dukes tells Louis that the Bastille has fallen and that de Launay has been killed by the mob. And Louis asks, Is it a rebellion? The duke answers, No, sire, it is a revolution. In the next episode of Relevant History, King Louis will meet with the Constituent Assembly and come to terms with the new order. We'll talk about the Assembly's famous meeting on August 28th, where the last vestiges of the feudal regime will be torn down in a single day's voting. We'll look at the famous Women's March on Versailles, and as the revolution spreads to the countryside, we'll talk about the so-called Great Fear, when nervous towns throughout France raise their own militias not to fight the king, but to protect themselves from each other. We'll also get to the comparison I promised in an earlier episode between the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen and the American Declaration of Independence. And, if time allows, we'll wrap up with the story of the famous, ill-fated flight to Varennes, when the royal family tries and fails to escape the country. If you're not subscribed to the show, make sure to hit that button and stay tuned for the next episode on the French Revolution. Hello again, it's Dan. Here to remind you that a Relevant History Patreon subscription now only costs $1 a month. So if you've been on the fence about subscribing, now is a great opportunity to get access to all 24 episodes of my video series, Dan's War College, along with the Relevant History Discord channel where you can chat with me and other patrons. Access to the Discord will remain $1 indefinitely but access to Dan's War College is for a limited time only. Once I get back to recording new episodes, only $5 patrons will have access. So get in now while the offer's still good. Link in the description. If you just want to read the occasional show update as well as random blurbs about sports and politics and whatever else is on my mind, you can find me on X, uh, better known as the app formerly known as Twitter, at at Dan Toller Podcast. That's at Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. If you want to correct an error, request an interview, or just say hi, you can reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. You can find other links, including some past interviews at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Finally, sharing an episode with your friends is the best way to help the show and grow the audience. So if you like what you're hearing, please give Relevant History a shout out on social media, Reddit, or wherever else you hang out online. It makes a big difference. And best of all, sharing is totally free. Thanks for listening.